Um, and before we aim to demystify pensions in just 25 minutes, I'd just like to remind you that we're providing guidance and information today just to help you make your own informed decisions about your pensions. The other thing is, as I go through, I will be mentioning websites and companies, um, but we are not incentivized in any way to mention them. We just think they've got some really good services that can be of value to you. OK, so what are we going to cover? We're going to start off by why we need a pension. Then we're going to take a look at where your retirement income is going to come from. And we'll drill down into the new state pension that's provided by the government. And we'll also go through the basics of how a workplace pension uh, scheme works as well. Then importantly, we're going to look at how much money you likely to need in retirement. And then why you would look at transferring old pension pots into the one that you have at the moment. Then we're going to finish off as where to go for help and support and we'll finish with a Q&A. Okay, so let's think about then why is it so important to even understand pensions? Why do we need one? Well, one of the reasons is how long we actually live. Now, at the moment, the average life expectancy for females is 87 and it's 84 for males. So it's not unrealistic to say that you could spend about a third of your life in retirement or at least uh, working fewer hours than you do now. And we're all going to need money to fund our, our lifestyle well after we've stopped work or reduced hours. And at the moment, the full state pension is just over about £200 a week. So just over 10,600 10, a year. And what you'll need to do is think, well, where's any additional income going to come from if I want my, my life to do other things that's going to cost me more than that? As you'd imagine, the state pension is unlikely to cover much more than your very basic expenditure. Now, one of the reasons it's not prudent just to rely on the state pension alone is that by 2050, one in four people are going to be over the age of 65. And bearing in mind that the government are dependent on people working, paying tax now to fund those who are drawing their state pensions, the older our population gets, the more strain it's going to be put on the UK pension system, particularly as we're living longer um, and due to medical advancements, we're, we're certainly living longer and our standard of living is going up. Now, there are no current major changes being made to the amount of state pension we'll pay, but it will depend on future governments and economics. So unfortunately, none of us have a crystal ball. So it's far better just to take control of our own retirement saving to ensure we've got enough for the life we want to lead. Now, if you're interested in knowing your own life expectancy based on your age and the country you live in, I've put a link to the BBC article at the bottom and that's got a prediction tool attached. But of course, it isn't just state pension and your workplace pension where your money will come from in later life. You know, lots of people are working part time or they're setting up small businesses in retirement and they're continuing to earn an income. You might also have other savings or property that you rent out or could sell. Maybe you've got some inheritance and other state benefits too. So it's really important when you're thinking about where that income is going to come from that you look at everything in the round, everything that's going to give you that bottom right hand corner of your pay slip. Um, you know, what income is, is going to be your take home figure? But all of those things are likely to be different for each person. So today we're going to focus on the pension elements, the new state pension and how your workplace pension scheme works. So let's start by looking at the state pension, because for most of us, this is going to represent a really important building block of our retirement income. Now, over the years, the rules of the state pension have changed. The last big overhaul was uh, in 2016, when the government replaced the basic state pension with the new state pension. And they did that with the aim of making it simpler to understand and fairer for everyone. So anybody who reaches state pension age on or after the 6th of April 2016, which I imagine is most of us on this webinar, we're gonna be entitled to the new state pension. And that's the one that I'm talking about today. Now, if you were retiring this tax year, the full new state pension is £203.85 a week or just over £10,600 a year. And in order to get that full amount, you need to have built up 35 qualifying years. So how do you build up a qualifying year? Well, you can do it in a few ways. 
The first one is to earn at least the lower earnings limit across the year. And for this tax year, the lower earnings limit is £6,396. Although, you know, this is below the level that we start paying national insurance because we don't pay national insurance until we, we hit 12570 But as long as you've earned at least that lower earnings limit of 6396 you'll be entitled to one qualifying year towards the state pension. If you've got partners or family who are self-employed, they can earn a qualifying year towards the state pension as long as they've got profits of above 6725 and they're paying national insurance contributions. Now, there might be tax years where you don't earn enough, for example, if you're having a career break or you've worked part time, um, but you could still be given a national insurance credit to give you that qualifying year as long as you've claimed certain state benefits. So things like child benefit for a child under 12 or universal credit, job seekers allowance, employment support allowance. So there are other ways that you can build up those qualifying years. And you need to have at least 10 qualifying years to get anything from the new state pension at all. But these don't need to be continuous years, they just need to be 10 years over your working lifetime. Once the state pension uh, comes into payment, it does increase every year. And at the moment, the state pension increases by the larger of the previous September's inflation rate, um, how much earnings have grown by, or two and a half percent. And that is known as the triple lock, and it's you know, whichever one is higher. Now, last year it increased by 10.1%, which was the rate of inflation. Um, and next April, it's going to increase again by another eight and a half percent because that's what inflation was last September, taking it to just over £220 a week. So when do you get your state pension? Well, the simple answer is you get it on your state pension age. But when is that? It's all going to depend on when you were born. So I've tried to simplify this as much as possible. If you were born after the 6th of April 1978, your state pension age is currently 68. If you were born between uh, 6th of April 1961 and the 5th of April 1978, your state pension is currently 67. However, there are plans afoot to raise that to 68. So watch the press on that one in the next few years. Um, if you were born before 1961, your state pension age is going to be somewhere between 65 and 67. But rather than me putting up a really long table showing all of the possibilities, the easiest way to check your own state pension age is to use that checker tool that I've put at the bottom on the gov.uk website, um, and you'll be able to find out exactly when you'll get that state pension. Now, the Department for Work and Pensions predicts that between 85% and 90% of people reaching state pension age are going to get the full amount. But rather than leave it to guesswork, you can go online, you can use the link shown here, and it will tell you how much you're likely to get based on your national insurance contribution record to date. Um, and you'll also be able to see the history of your payments as well. Um, you will be required to have an HMRC login, their gateway account, to do that. If you haven't got a gateway account, you can either fill in a form BR19, which you'll find online on the gov.uk website, or you can call the Future Pension Centre and they'll send it in the post to you within six weeks. The last thing I want to say on state pension, it's really important to note that you don't get it automatically. You do have to claim the state pension. So you should receive a letter about eight weeks before you reach state pension age and they'll tell you how to claim that, but you will need to fill out a form. Okay, so that's the basics of the new state pension. Let's now uh, move on to look at how workplace pension schemes uh, operate. And today I'm talking about the type of scheme that most employers have, and these are defined contribution pension schemes. Now, if you are fortunate enough to still be in a final salary scheme, because there's only 500 of those schemes left in the UK that are still open to members, um, I'm not going to be going through all the details of those today. So please do contact your scheme administrators for more information if you're in a final salary. So today we're talking about defined contribution. Now, according to UK law, anyone who's over the age of 22 and earning at least £10,000 a year has to be automatically enrolled into a pension scheme. But if anyone's under this age or salary, they can opt to join the workplace pension if they want to. Now, these auto uh, enrolment rules were brought in in 2012 just to make sure that people were saving for themselves for the future and not just relying on the state pension. 
So in really simple terms, a pension, you pay contributions in, your employer pays contributions in, these get invested in your pension pot. So over the long term, you start to receive investment returns as well. And the idea is that you're just trying to build up as big a savings pot as you possibly can that's going to provide you with an income when you get to retirement. Now, in order to incentivize people to save into pensions, the government does provide tax relief at your highest rate on contributions that you pay into a pension scheme. So if you are a basic rate taxpayer, um, you're saving yourself 20% tax. If you're a higher rate taxpayer, which is generally people earning over £50,000, you'll be saving 40% tax on the contributions you pay in. Now, this tax relief is usually given through payroll, but do check with your employer that that's the case. Um, and there's no other savings vehicle that is as tax efficient as a pension. Now, at the moment, you can withdraw money from your pension any age between from 55, but that age is rising to 57 when we get to 2028. Now, in terms of how much you need to contribute, your employer must pay in at least 3% of your qualifying earnings. And qualifying earnings are those earnings between £6,240 and £50,000. Um, and in total, under the auto enrolment rules, you must have 8% of those qualifying earnings being paid in overall, which means if your employer is only paying 3%, you need to pay 5%. But some employers are far more generous than that. Um, they may pay more, but whatever they pay, let's say they pay fee 5%, you'd be expected to make that up to eight and pay three. Now, a lot of employers are more generous and they pay a percentage of basic salary. So that's on all of your earnings rather than that kind of qualifying band earnings. That makes it simpler. It's more generous. So do check your pension booklet or information for your scheme to see what happens at your company. And remember that under, you know, this minimum is just intended as a start. You can pay more in it if you wish, if you want to try and bigger build a, pot, a bigger pot for retirement. Now, it's really worth checking to see if your employer has a matching contribution system in place. For example, they might say, here's the minimum you have to pay. But if you pay an extra 1%, we'll pay an extra 1% or 2% and so on. You know, And by doing that, essentially, every extra percent that they put into your pension is just a deferred pay rise. So do see and make sure that you're making the most of any matching contribution arrangements in place. Now, if you're a long way off retirement yet, and you're not really sure what kind of income you're aiming for, a general rule of thumb is to aim to pay half of your age as a percentage into your pension. And that's between you and your employer. So let's say you're aged 30. Half of that is 15. So you're aiming for a 15 percent contribution into your pension to give you a decent level of, of living uh, standard of living at retirement. So if your employer is paying 5 percent, you should be aiming for 10 to make that up to that that 15 percent. Now, in most pension schemes, you are able to increase, reduce or stop contributions at any time with one month's notice. Um, and But you should try and set your contributions at a rate that you can afford to maintain. In terms of the maximum you can pay in, you can pay up to 100% of your earnings into pension every year and still get tax relief on it. That's up to an annual limit of £60,000. That's known as the annual allowance. Um, and if you are going to put more in, remember that maximum does include any employer contributions that are paid. So now what happens is when your pension uh, company receives those monthly contributions from you and your employer, they're usually invested in shares of companies because they're trying to help that money grow over time and hopefully keep pace with inflation. Now, typically, you'll be invested in a mixed type fund, which holds lots of different shares in companies all across the world, not just in one company, because that helps to spread the risk. And typically, the further away you are from retirement, the more risk you can afford to take those contributions. And by risk, I mean putting your money into those assets that are generally more volatile, likely to fluctuate over time, like shares in companies, but typically over the longer term will provide higher returns. And as you can't touch pensions at the moment until you're 55 anyway, 
These are long-term investments and you've got longer to ride out those market fluctuations. Now, if you're somebody with a lower appetite for risk or you're closer to taking your benefits from your pension, you might want to consider lower risk funds over the short term. Uh, things like government bonds, which are also known as gilts, because these give you a guaranteed rate of return rather than you just relying on the market. But the other thing that happened with auto enrollment rules is that the government made it a legal requirement for pension schemes to have a default investment option. Now, that default fund is generally what's known as a lifestyle profile. And what happens with lifestyle is that uh, when you're younger and you're more than 10 years away from retirement, your money is in, it automatically invested in those higher risk funds, those stocks and shares with the aim of getting a bigger uh return over time. But then automatically, in that 10 to 15 years before you retire, your money is automatically moved into lower risk investments over the short term. So that by the time you get to retirement, you know how much money is in your pot, and it's protected. And that's why it's so important to keep your workplace pension up to date with what your selected retirement age is, because if they are automatically switching your funds out of those higher risk funds into the lower risk funds, they want to make sure that, that you're, you're all aiming towards the same date. But do remember, even if you're in the default now, you do have the option to choose any of the other funds that your pension has available. Um, your, your pension fund provider should be able to give you investment fact sheets so that you can see all of the funds available and how they've performed over time. But don't worry if the investment side isn't for you. Typically, about 95 percent of people stay in that default fund that, that's all automatically set up. But it's just important for you to know you've got other choices if you want them. If you do decide to switch your money into other funds, always check the charges of those funds and, and make sure that the risk profile of those funds suits you and your outlook on investment. OK, so the contributions paid in plus the investment returns you receive will make up the eventual pension pot that you've got. And the bigger the pot size, the more you're going to have to live on in retirement. Now, what options do you have? Well, when you decide to draw your pension, you've got a few options. You can always take up to 25% of the money that you've saved as a tax-free cash sum. And you can take that, you can do whatever you want with it. If you don't need any more money at that time, you can then just keep the remaining money invested until such time that you need it. Alternatively, number two, is that you could hand over all of that money that you've saved up. You could hand it over to an insurance company of your choice. And in return, they will give you a guaranteed income for the rest of your life, for however long you live. And that is what's known as, a, as an annuity. Some people looking at number three with smaller pots might decide, actually, I've saved all that money. I want all of that money back in one go. And particularly if people have got smaller pots. But remember, only 25 percent of the pot is tax free. The rest is going to be treated as earned income and you will pay income tax at your highest rate on any other money you've got coming in. Or instead, you can keep the money invested if you want to and draw an income from the fund as and when you want to. And that is known as pension drawdowns. That's option number four. And that is the most popular option nowadays. Or number five, you can do a bit of everything if you want to. For example, you could take your tax free cash. Then you can leave the rest invested and just draw an income from it as and when you want to. But then as you get older, think, right, well, you know, I don't know how much longer I've got to live. Let me hand over the remaining money I've got saved to that insurance company to give me a secured income for life. So you've got lots of different choices. And again, your pension booklet should really set out all of the options that you have. But in any event, your pension provider will write to you with the options available as you approach your selected retirement age. So let's now look at a very important question. How much income are you likely to need? Now, a sensible place to start is to consider what sort of lifestyle and therefore the income that you're aiming for. 
Now, most people will aim for roughly two thirds of their pre-retirement income, assuming that the housing costs like mortgages have been repaid. Um, and, you know, if they wish to continue that similar standard of living into retirement, typically two thirds. But you might have a different idea as to how you see your lifestyle once you stop or reduce work. But to give you an idea of the sort of income you should be targeting, the retirement living standards were published a few years ago. This is really to say, right, what kind of income would you need if you wanted a minimum uh, lifestyle, a moderate lifestyle or a comfortable? And these figures uh, were updated at the end of 2022. And all of the figures shown are after tax. So as you can see, research suggests that you're going to need an income of uh, £12,800 per year as a single person or £19,900 a year as a couple to have a very minimum standard of living in retirement. So that isn't a car. That's £54 a week on food shopping and one week and one weekend in, in the UK as a holiday. If you wanted a moderate standard of living, that increases to just over £23,000 for a single person or £34,000 for a couple. You have a three-year-old car, which you replace every 10 years, two weeks holiday in Europe, and so on. And for comfortable, just over £37,000 for a single or £54,500 for a couple. Now, I thought I'd look at the government data, and that shows that the average weekly income for pensioners in the UK at the moment is £361 after tax and housing. So that's about £19,000 a year. So most of them are towards that moderate uh, standard of living. So let's just say you're aiming for £30,000 a year in retirement. The state pension is a good foundation you're going to get about a third of that from the state. But remember, it doesn't kick into a state pension age. So to top that up, you're going to need to save about £20,000 a year, enough to provide that. Now, if you were getting all of that from pensions, if you think when you get to state pension age, you're going to live for about 20 years, you want £20,000 a year, so 20 times 20, you're going to need to build up a pot of approximately £400,000. That's a rough rule of thumb. Now, that might seem like a huge number, but if you start saving at 22, you continue to save every month until your state pension age and your employer is paying in as well. And remember, you're getting all of those investment returns that's a very achievable number over those 40 years of saving. So something just to aim for there, something to think about. Now, if you have got old pension schemes with past employers or maybe personal pensions that you've set up when you've been self-employed, you are able to transfer the majority of pensions into your latest pension scheme if you want to. Um, and to do this, the easiest way is to contact your current pension provider and tell them that you wish to transfer. They will ask you who that pension is with, what your policy number is, and the rough amount of that pension pot, how much you've got saved. Then what they will do, they will contact your old pension scheme and they will arrange for that money to be brought across. But along the way, they will check that you're not giving up on any guarantees or special rules that wouldn't be in your best interest. For example, if you do have a final salary plan elsewhere, it's very unusual for people to transfer those out because there are lots of guarantees in place. Now, the reasons to transfer, you keep all of your, your pension pots together, you might pay lower charges, you'll have access to different investment options, and it just makes retirement planning easier for a lot of people. Now, as I'm saying this, some of you may have the Chancellor's statement on in the background, because one of the things we're expecting the Chancellor to announce today is that it might be introducing pension pots for life. This is where in future you would choose the pension scheme that you want your employer to pay into rather than having to pay, pay into the workplace pension. Um, so, as I say, I mean, this is hot off the press. Do keep an eye on the news. It might be in future that this is all about to change. You'll be able to choose your own pension provider. But that's all I wanted to say today. I know we're going to have lots of questions. So I just wanted to finish off by saying if you want to do some more research of your own, I've put on a screen a whole range of resources that you can access um, from articles on from which on how much you need to retire all the way through to planning your retirement on the gov.uk website. And of course, I must put up uh, the help and support available from both the ICE Benevolent Fund and Support Network that give fantastic support to all their members. So I've put the contact details here. 
Okay, Sarah, I've, that's got to the end of my slides. I've seen that we've had uh, lots of questions coming in. Um, far away, and I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. That's great, thank you. So the first question that we've had come in is, if someone has time off to look after children who were receiving child benefits and haven't received the year's credit towards their pension qualifying years and have already started receiving a state pension, how do I correct the situation? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, and we do know that there were some errors made um, around this. Um, there will be a helpline number for the DWP in order to rectify that. And I know they're rectifying lots of ones. So um, if I can share the number afterwards, Sarah, that would be really helpful. But if you just uh, search for DWP state pension helpline, um, in fact, it may even a bit, that was the future pension scheme thing. Yeah, let me share it afterwards. But if you search that, you should be able to uh, contact them and talk them through that situation and hopefully get it rectified. That's great. Thank you very much. And moving on, who controls these funds and how much risk of losing your pension fund is there? And this was in relation to the investment fund slide. Yeah. OK, so um, if you are in a default, if you've just gone into the default, basically your employer has worked with the pension provider to work out who that fund is. Now, it's the pension provider that looks after that fund. So, for example, your pension might be with Legal and General or Aviva or Standard Life. And it's these companies that are, have got fund managers who are looking after those funds and investing your money on your behalf. Now, when it comes to pension funds, there is something called uh, the, the pension protection fund in place. Um, and it means that all, all of your assets are held separately to your employer. So if your employer went bust, your pension fund nowadays under new rules are kept entirely separate so you won't lose them. If the uh, pension provider went bust, um, then again, your pension is protected under this particular compensation scheme. Because, of course, many years ago, we've heard lots of horror stories about people losing money because their companies went bust. So the government changed that regulation. So all are now held separately. So most companies, you should receive the majority of your pension. That's great. Thank you. And how long do I need to live to receive back all the money that I invested? Uh, well, interesting one. So, I mean, I guess it depends on uh, obviously people that tend to live for around 20 years, uh, normally break even for those that are living 30 or 40, they're, they're normally making money. This is if you've taken that money and you've given it to an insurance company in return, they're giving you an income. Um, but what happens under workplace pensions? Let's say you get to retirement. Let's say you left it invested like most people do nowadays and you've just drawn a bit of income. If you were to die, whatever's left in your pot will be paid tax free to a beneficiary of your choice. So when you set up your pension, if you if you don't remember filling in your nomination form or sometimes it's called an expression of wish form, please go back, get that updated because that's who your money would go to in the event um, of your death. That's great, thank you. And if you're contributing your maximum pension offered by your company, but can contribute more, should you contribute to a second pension scheme? Um, well, most employer pensions will allow you to um, increase contributions within their scheme. And the reason you might want to do that is because they've set it up as a group scheme. There's economies of scale and you'll normally find that the charges on a, a group workplace pension are lower than if you just went and set up a pension yourself. So that would be the first thing to investigate. Can I pay more contributions into my workplace pension? If for any reason you didn't want to do that and you wanted to put extra into a different pension, like a person pension, you're well within your rights to do that as well. Um, but if you do want to receive tax relief on all of your contributions to, to the different pensions in one year, you do just need to make sure that you're under that maximum limit, which is either 100% of your annual salary or £60,000 if less. That's great. And just one more, because I see a couple of people have asked this question. Uh, if you've lost track of your pensions from previous jobs or employers, is there a way to track them down? 
There is. So, I mean, the first thing I would always suggest is you don't need to pay a company to do this. Um, first of all, I mean, for example, if you knew that you worked in Tesco many years ago and you're not sure, just Google Tesco Pension Scheme. Their Tesco Pension Department phone number and contact details will come up. If you just, I, I'm, I'm using Tesco as an example, but it could be any firm. If you find them on Google, pop them an email, give them your national insurance number and say, I just want to know if I've got a pension with you. Um, they'll be able to do that. Or if you know you worked at a firm and you've got friends there who maybe have got pension statements, that will give you the contact details. If you can't find any contact details or you don't even remember the name of the, the company that you work for, there is a Department for Work and Pensions tracing service. Um, if you just, again, uh, put that into a search engine, uh, kind of pension tracing service, it should come up with gov.uk. That's the free service um, and they, they can help you. Now, between now and 2030, there is going to be a thing launched called the Pensions Dashboard which is where um, you should be able to go onto it and put in your national insurance number and it should be able to pull in all of the pensions that you've ever been a member of. We're not there yet. Uh, the government are working on it. It's been delayed because of lovely things, uh, particularly like the COVID-19 pandemic, but that is coming further down the line. So a few things there. Um, try and do it yourself just by a simple uh, search engine search. Number two, uh, go onto the DWP Pension Tracing Service. And three, watch out for the pensions dashboard, which is coming.